joining us now is OG Genex. Oh, Jenica. Okay. <laughs> His story is turning around the world. Hello, Jenex. He, he, he added a little bit of tone to it. Oh, Jenica. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Where is your name? It is, as always. <laughs> Good morning, Tundu. Good morning, OG. We got the memo. Monochrome this yes. morning. Yes. <laughs> you look lovely. As do you. Thank you. Good morning, Rafai. Good morning, OG. How are you? Great, thank you. Looking great, as always. And you, too. Yeah. Well, good morning to you viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. In Russia, a plane carrying 28 passengers that crashed in the eastern part of the country on Tuesday was set to be on its way from Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky, the region's capital, to the town of Palana when it disappeared from radar and fell to land as scheduled. There were 22 passengers and six crew members on board. Authorities say one of the passengers was a child. In the United Kingdom, 19-year-old Danielle Hussein, who was found guilty on Tuesday of murdering two sisters in a London park, told the court he made a bizarre pact with Satan to kill the two women in return for winning the lottery. In Ukraine, the Ministry of Defense has defended its decision to train female soldiers to march in high heels following an outcry from local lawmakers. The ministry says the soldiers will proceed to march in a parade to mark the 30th anniversary of independence from the Soviet Union on August 24. In Denmark, the world's tallest COVID-themed sand castle has been unveiled. The 69-foot pyramid-shaped castle, designed by 30 artists, was built with 4.8 tons of sand and stands 11.4 feet higher than the previous record holder. In India, the death of an 84-year-old priest known as Father Stan Swami, who was detained under an anti-terrorism law and was also denied bail, has caused outrage in the country. The priest was arrested in October 2020 on allegations that he had connections with a radical group that reportedly caused violence in the state of Maharashtra in 2018. In Nigeria, a Kano State High Court on Tuesday fined the governor of the state, Abdullahi Umar Ganduje, the sum of 800,000 naira as cost for expenses incurred in the court case over a story where he was purportedly seen stuffing foreign currency in his pocket. The fine came after the governor discontinued his defamation suit against the online publication Daily Nigerian and its publisher, Jafar Jafar. Under sports, three sisters, Neka, Erika, and Chineye Ogumike, are on the threshold of history after they were listed in the 15-woman provisional list submitted to the Nigeria Basketball Federation by head coach Otis Hugli. It will be the first time the three sisters will be on the same national team at the Olympic Games. Finally, under entertainment, the 74th annual Cannes Film Festival opened on Tuesday, despite social distancing subduing some of its signature glamour. It is the first fully-fledged film festival since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, and Oscar-winning director Spike Lee makes history as the first black president of the jury, where he will head nine artists and actors tasked with voting on the prestigious Palme d'Or. Let's begin what's trending in the United Kingdom. Following the arrest of the leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, Namdi Kanu, the UK parliament says it is now set to commence a debate on the repatriation of the separatist leader. In a parliamentary schedule posted on its website, the date set for the debate is Wednesday, July 7th. According to the document, Lord Alton of Liverpool will be raising the issue at the House of Lords and will query the Nigerian government on the separatist leader's transfer to Nigeria. The British government had said that Kanu, who was traveling with a British passport, was not arrested within the United Kingdom's territory as controversy continued to trail the circumstances and where Kanu was repatriated from. In another development, Kelechi Madu, the Minister of Justice and Solicitor General of the Government of Alberta in Canada, has slammed the Nigerian Minister of Justice and Attorney General of the Federation, Abuba Kamalami, over the rearrest of the IPOB leader. In a post on his LinkedIn page, Kelechi wrote that if reports that Kanu was abducted were true, 
Malami was not only a disgrace to the rule of law, but was also not worthy to be a public officer and called on world leaders to apply appropriate sanctions on Nigeria. Well, there are two sides to this story. The Nigerian government will argue that Kano is a Nigerian, and we as a sovereign state have the right to treat their citizen in the manner in which they deem fit. But you know that Kano is also a British citizen, and so that's why the um, you know, UK parliament has set this uh, date of Wednesday the 7th to uh, find out what really went wrong there. Well, the UK parliament also weighs in when it's not dealing with British citizens. Right. You'll recall the debate about NSAS that had nothing to do with British nationality. That was just to do with the rule of law and what they found to be egregious that was happening in Nigeria. And closer to home, I'm remembering my dad today, John Major, who was a prime minister at the time, not just a regular minister, argued passionately in Parliament about June 12th. And we all know how that ended. Today marks the 23rd year of his passing. So we know that Maybe made so no difference. Rest. Amen. Thank you, darling. It made not a blind bit of difference, quite frankly, because a sovereign nation will do what it chooses. All other nations can do is advocate yes. and, you know, try and, con you know, convince. Look at what's happening in England. I've been following the case of Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe, a British Iranian lady who went on holiday with her daughter to Iran and was jailed in Iran. And her husband has been protesting. Boris Johnson weighed in as foreign minister. He weighed in as prime minister. She still is there languishing in jail. She has served her whole term. Then they now added a few extra years just to torment her. And there's absolutely nothing the British government can do. This is the sad reality of it. You are really at the mercy of your sovereign state, where you happen to be once you're detained and what have you. And now to Madhu, who is the Chief Justice Minister, I believe, in Alberta, yes, Canada, Canada, speaking so passionately, lambasting our Attorney General um, Malami. I guess he's coming from the point of rule of law, like I said, the procedure. Like I said in the interview that we had with Namdi Kanu's lawyer, that process that they described, which is yet to be proved, but what they have described is unknown to Kenyan law. That process that they described of him being arrested and beaten and what have you, Kenyan law is actually quite strict. They have extradition treaties that even claim that if an offense is political in character, the fugitive should not be surrendered. Yes. So how did this happen? We don't know. I guess an, the investigation will be made. But I want to remind Mr. Madhu that even in Canada, we all perceive Canada to be the home of the nicest people ever. They're so laid back. Their president, their, their current um, prime minister, his dad, Pierre Trudeau, when he was prime minister of Canada, he took the gloves off on the Quebec liberation front. He instituted war measures acts in peacetime. There were mass arrests. There was suspension of rights, including habeas corpus, because that group turned itself into a terrorist organization. They were killing. They were kidnapping. And Pierre Trudeau dealt with them with an iron fist. Every country will protect its sovereignty. That's just the bottom line. Yeah. But what we ask in a democracy is that the rule of law is upheld, that the procedures are upheld. This is no longer a banana republic. We're no longer in the military era. Yeah, the Kenyan government has denied any corroboration with the Nigerian they, government. They have to in, because it's shocking. Yeah, in extraditing Kano. Okay, a number of points. One, we live in an international community. It's a global community. If anything happens anywhere in the world, you are likely to have parliaments all over the world and uh, you know, interested persons making comments. This is what has happened in this particular instance. I wouldn't be surprised if tomorrow, uh, you know, Kanu's arrest, Igbo's, uh, uh, you know, attack, uh, is discussing uh, the parliament in North Korea, uh, if they have one, or is discussing uh, in China, you know, by the uh, Communist Party. So that should be expected. The second thing is that, look, what has brought all this about is the lack of transparency on the part of the Nigerian government Correct. with regard to the circumstances of arrest, where he was extradited from, and you know, not coming out in the open will, of course, raise questions, not just internationally, but also uh, locally, because you are dealing uh, with uh, not just public international law, but also uh, fundamental human rights within the uh, uh, global uh, you know, uh, framework. Uh, the third point is that, yes, uh, the House of Commons wants to uh, debate uh, Kanu's arrest. Yes, he has British citizenship. And approaches have been made to the uh, uh, House of Commons in England uh, by Kanu's supporters to say that the British government 
should wade into the matter. The British High Commission in Nigeria has also been queried as to how and why uh, Kano uh, got access to his uh, British uh, passport, passport uh, by the uh, you know uh, by Nigerian authorities. And I said, well, he could get a travel certificate once he was able to leave Nigeria uh, in September. Uh, 2017. You could get a travel certificate maybe from Ghana, from Togo, from wherever. So the British, uh, you know, lawmakers, they are showing interest in something that involves a British citizen. But I've also made the point that the fact that you have dual nationality does not confine any kind of humanity. It does not say because you are a British citizen, you can under, uh, overwhelm or undermine the sovereignty yeah, and integrity yeah. of another state Correct. that is a sovereign unto itself. So the debate in the House of Commons will merely serve the useful purpose of citizen diplomacy, showing interest in someone who has a you know, British uh, passport. But Britain or England or the United Kingdom is not in a position to dictate to Nigeria as to how Nigeria you know, uh, goes about enforcing its own law. Questions can be raised, and the British House of Commons does not represent the British government. It's not the British government, it's not uh, Britain or speaking as government. It is just parliament having a debate. But that debate may well be useful because one of the things they want to do is to query Kenya. Yeah. Uh, you know, they can do that. You know, this is a British citizen but Kenya on your has territory. Denied. Why did you hand him over uh, to, uh, to Nigeria? They can raise such questions. They want to find out whether Kanu was, uh, uh, you know, uh, rendered to Nigeria against his will. They also want to find out mm -hmm. what support the British High Commission in Nigeria is offering. So they are likely to come up with some statements about rule of law, right. about Kano's rights being respected. And I don't think that the Nigerian government will say uh, that his rights uh, can be disrespected. As for Kelechi Madu, the Attorney General and Solicitor General uh, in uh, Alberta, Canada, don't forget he's Nigerian, uh, although he's also Canadian, he also has a dual nationality, uh, and at the same time he's also Igbo. His comments are more political than legal. He made a point about, oh, you know, violation of the rule of law, international law, and he reportedly abused uh, uh, Malami. Well, as an uh, attorney general of Alberta, uh, Canada, he's not in a position uh, to dictate to the attorney general of Nigeria. That's one point. The second point is that he made more of political points, the points that have been made by many Nigerians, that look, when you have injustice, when you have inequity, when you suppress people, when you do not allow an open society, you are likely to have people turning against the state and protesting. And that as far as he is concerned, he doesn't think that uh, Nam De Kanu is, uh, you know, uh, has committed any offense. That what he has done is to raise certain issues and that the protest by IPOP has been uh, peaceful. Where he is far away in Alberta, Canada. He's not uh, in Southeast Nigeria. Finally, I think that what the Nigerian government needs to do is rather than to characteristically say, oh, they don't know what they are talking about. This is our own issue. They also need to engage the international community, provide evidence, provide explanation, and not play the ostrich. Because oftentimes that's where we drop the ball in Nigeria. We say, oh, it's our country. Don't dictate to us. No, that kind of arrogance is no longer accepted under the international order uh, that we uh, you know, uh, have. So whatever comes out of the House of Commons, we expect the Office of the Attorney General to be more transparent. That Since is this is point, not just really. a matter of local concern, it's a matter of global concern. We need transparency. Rufai, your analysis. Two things I'll say. Number one, the government owes the people a duty to be truthful to the people. And you see, when we keep going the route of national security, I always ask the question, is it the security of the states or the security of a particular regime we are talking about here. So if we go one step further to say, yes, the state has the autonomy, it can do everything, it's a sovereign. But the question is, so that means if somebody has a right of protest and it goes a little bit against, or it goes against the state in some aspects, then the rights of the person does not hold sway because of the states and because of the particular regime. And I'll go back historically. At a point, too, the likes, the people we call founding fathers today were what's called rabble rousers by the British when they were asking for independence. 
The likes of Awolo and Namdi Azikiwe and Co. But it goes back to the conversation on listening to them. And that's why we had the Lancaster House talks. All I'm just calling for in all of this is, let's listen to one another. Let us listen to one another. Let us not just stifle voices. You see, this council culture and the conversation is what matters a great deal. It's so easy to say, yes, we're a sovereign nation. We are so sovereign when we want to buy arms and weapons. We depend on other foreign countries. And they slam us embargoes because of things that are political in our own country. So like Dr. Abatia said, we should have a conversation too with these Western nations if they are raising this concern. But truthfully, in all of this, let's never forget that power is transient. And the fact that somebody cannot be in power forever. Let's not forget that the incumbent president too at some point was protesting, he was tear gassed, he was maltreated, he went to court and he got that famous injunction that you don't even need the police permit to protest. So in balancing this out, let's be truthful to ourselves. And when people have discordant tunes, I don't support the way of violence, but also we should call ourselves to order and talk to ourselves. Nobody supports, I condemn violence in its entirety and I condemn bloodshed. But can we talk? Can we have these conversations about the fordrance of our nations, of our nation? Because these are the conversations we've always had since 1960. Since Nigeria was formed, we kept on having conversations. And a lot of people, every group in this country has said they want to leave at some point. We forget it was the North that first said, Araba, we want to leave. In the 60s, when there was an interregnum between the 29th of July to the 1st of August, before we had a leader, it was said that the likes of Murtala Muhammad were quick to say, let the North leave this union. Can we talk? All right, Rufai. I feel we can salvage Nigeria, but it starts by talking. All right, we'll take another story. Federal lawmakers on Tuesday engaged in a heated argument on the floor of the Senate over the legality of the Senate to legislate on animals, animal husbandry, and livestock. The bill sponsored by Senate leader Yahya Abdullahi seeks for an act to regulate the slaughter of donkeys and establish the breeding and ranching of donkeys through the export certificate value chain to mitigate the extinction of donkeys. However, minority leader, of the Senate, Einaya Abaribe, who kicked against the bill, argued that animals, animal husbandry, and livestock are not part of the 68 items on the exclusive list, which can be legislated upon by the Senate. Uh, Dr. Abati, over to you on the story. Okay, um, as it turned out, the uh, minority, the Senate minority leader, um, Senator Abaribe Einaya, uh, was overruled. Yes. And the uh, Senate decided to uh, consider the bill. So. We need not go into the uh, legality about what is on the residual list, what is on the exclusive list. What is very clear is that every country needs to take very seriously, you know, its wildlife habitat, uh, you know, conservation issues uh, in the country. And I think that it is important uh, that such a matter had been brought uh, before uh, the National Assembly. There's nothing ethnic about it. There's nothing regional about it. I think it has to do with one, our habitat, the flora and fauna, and also how animals are exploited in this country. The main uh, argument put forward in his motion by uh, Senator Muhammad, who uh, presented the bill, was about how the population of donkeys is being depleted and how we need to preserve donkeys. Donkeys, not just in Nigeria or elsewhere, are used in rural communities, majorly for transportation and other purposes. But the argument that he put forward is that if you look at the situation in Nigeria, uh, the population of donkeys is being reduced because there is a trade, there is a donkey trade uh, that is going on, and uh, you know the population is being reduced. Now, why is it important? Why is the population of donkeys important? Donkeys take a very long time before they get pregnant. The gestation period is almost about two, three years. So, even if you want to increase the population of donkeys, uh, it's not that easy. And hence, he says that look, many Nigerians now are trading in donkey skin. And the major destination, the largest market for donkey export is China. In China, they use donkey uh, for, they use the skin uh, for beauty products. 
They even use it as a, a part of donkey as aphrodisiac. Uh, they, they even use it for health purposes, to strengthen blood and vitality. You know, vitality. It's called egiao, egiao. That's what they call it in uh, China. So there is an egiao aphrodisiac market in China that is a major destination for donkeys from across the world. And what uh, Senator Mohammed has brought forward is not necessarily original. Egypt also has issues with China, with donkey export. Kenya, in uh, 2016, created donkey abattoirs. But when they discovered that uh, over 300,000 donkeys had disappeared from China within a very short period, in 2020, Kenya passed legislation to shut down donkey markets and abattoirs in uh, Kenya. It is the same thing you know, in other parts uh, of the world, in Egypt and also in Ethiopia, where in Ethiopia they have very strict regulation against uh, uh, donkey exports. So this is the way to look at it from an enlightened perspective. Yes. The only thing that was missing in Senator Mohammed's uh, proposal, as I saw it, is, okay, what strategies are we putting in place with regard to increasing donkey population and seeking that balance? What kind of support uh, are you providing with regard to donkey farming? which they are now doing in Kenya yeah. and uh, Ethiopia. And okay, look at the US. Five days ago, the House of Representatives in the United States passed legislation with regard to mink. Mink for uh, the calling of mink for commercial purposes. So countries take interest in this because yeah. it's about the environment. But I guess the subject about the environment uh, may not be so clear uh, to uh, many Nigerians. So Senator Mohammed has my support, and I hope that it's not only a uh, donkey they will yeah. worry about. They also have to worry about people who are perpetually looking for wildlife for pepper soup. <laughs> yes, my Nigeria is one of those few countries well. in the world where yes. animals are not safe. Yes. People will eat anything, including crocodile, including uh, dolphins, yeah. including yeah. whatever. Just ranching for Whatever. Yes, they will eat anything. Propose save, ranching for donkeys. Save as well. Eeyore. Yes, save I'm them all. Support. <laughs> you know Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> We shall take our final story in Kassena State. In response to the state governor, Aminu Bello Masari's directive to citizens of the state that they should defend themselves against bandit attacks, members of the state's People's Democratic Party social media organization have decided to sharpen their skills in the use of locally made catapults for self-defense against the bandits in a training exercise tagged Operation Catapult Shoot, as seen in photos now circulating on social media. I had to bring this story up to you do... You had to. Well done for reading that with a straight face. You're a better woman than me. I could not have man. The other day he made me laugh while I was taking a, a very serious story. But I mean, this one I did read you with a straight you, face. You, you did. Well done, you. But, you know, the, the, the saying is don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Yes. Now look at them bringing catapults. Poor dears. When David versus people... Goliath. Right. Thank you for that. David, well, I mean, David I mean, versus but, Goliath. But, I mean, look at our country. They then want to fight bandits with catapults. I mean, Dr. Abati, what really is AK-47 wielding <laughs> bandits. Right. No, they... I, I think maybe they mean this as some kind of metaphor. Yeah. Operation of catapult course. Food. Shoot. I don't of think course. anybody will readily believe that the way to attack a bandit is course. to use, you know, uh, you know uh, a slingshot you know, a mm -hmm. catapult. Uh, it, I guess it's a reference to David versus Goliath. Bandits have become Goliaths in Nigeria. But the thing is to take, you know, reasonable steps, concrete steps, scientific steps to be able to curb that. Yeah. If everybody uh, in Nigeria begins to carry catapult, it will have no effect. But I, I get the metaphorical, the last time I I get the metaphorical yes, I implication yes. of that message. You, you said Rufai, maybe they are... Did they think that the bandits are pigeons? Or what did you say? I thought I heard you say that. <laughs> what? What did you say? What did you say? I thought I heard you say that. You, no, that... I, I, I did not say anything. Oh, okay. I mean, Go I mean ahead I, I'm, I'm laughing too with you guys how we have just mocked Section 14, Section 2B of our Constitution. When a governor says people should defend themselves, and you go back to the fact that the sovereignty of the people, uh, the government derives the sovereignty from the people for uh, 2A. And 2B says the government must provide security for its people. And that same government is now pushing the case of security back to its people by protecting themselves. I mean, exactly. it just shows the very unpalatable state of our country. So right. if they want us to protect ourselves, how about they say we should, we should be able to get weapons more than catapults? Because that, that, that picture is not a lie. 
That's the only that's thing you can carry to protect yourself. I think it's really. such a strong message. It's a thank strong you, message. Well, thank, thank, thank you, you Dr. Vati. Uh, thank you, guys. Well, I the government has been very consistent tomorrow. in saying to defend Nigeria is a collective responsibility. All right, then. You know, and I, I take the catapult story as some kind of metaphor. metaphor. You can I, help with information. I hope, I hope it is. You can help by <laughs> taking do. certain precautionary yes. steps. All right, okay. then. Thank See you, you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.